Let's see if we can find some good old fashioned house music. people you throw a rock you're gonna hit five DJs in Chicago. I felt that we could take this music and make it into something big. We really did move the boundaries because we didn't know where the boundaries were. We barely knew what we were doing and that was the genius of it. I don't think we thought about the fact that it was a movement. We just knew that we were on to something. usually start it right from the get. It's an old Paul McCartney song, so everybody recognizes it. Somebody's ringing the bell. Do me a favor. Open the door. It says my message, let the people in, baby. It's 1970, and I had been going out dancing a little bit and collecting records. And I'm at a party at my brother's house, and it's the most boring party, Snoresville, USA. Everyone's falling asleep. So I put on You're the One or something like that, and this girl comes out of the bedroom and says, hi, I'm Dale, I'm dating your brother. You like this music? I wanna take you to a fabulous party. 647 Broadway, I'll never forget it. David Mancuso's loft. We go in this little hallway, open the door, and I move on to this dance floor. And as the record is playing, it comes to a peak, and these bright lights go on, and then everything goes off. And all I hear is this sound, this perfect sound. I knew in my soul, in my heart, in all my body, that that music was moving me to my core, and I knew it was gonna move a lot, a lot of people. And that was, for me, the beginning of dance music. The music is just a reflection of the culture. It's a microcosm of what's actually happening out in the world. People started to ask for their voices to be heard. The women's movement, the gay movement, black power movement, all these things started to cross-pollinate each other and we became comrades. And it played itself out in nightclubs. The loft made you feel welcome, regardless of where you were coming from, if you were gay, straight, black, white, Puerto Rican. It was the precursor, the template for those clubs that would follow. When the gallery opened, everybody showed up there. We went from having 80 to 100 people to having 600 people. An overnight success needs more staff, more food, more everything. I hired Frankie Knuckles, and he said to me, I have this friend. His name is Larry LeVan. I'd like to bring him. And I said, we need two people on balloons. Fine, I trust your judgment. At 12 months, Larry started playing at the Continental Bets, and Frankie worked his lights. Larry took all the influences that he had, David at the loft, me at the gallery, and he was a great DJ, right out of the box. And then six or eight months later, Frankie took over for Larry at the beds. He sounded and played just like Larry played. He didn't really have an identity as a DJ when he was in New York. Two hundred six South Jefferson, in the house, the warehouse with the great Frankie Knuckles. Three levels of pure partying. It's like uh, 
a landmark in my mind. Chicago was dead, and the people there was never introduced to an after-hours scene like the loft in New York. So I launched the warehouse. It was a private gay club that opened up at 12 midnight and closed at like 8 in the morning, something like that. The people in Chicago had never heard a sound system like that. People were losing their minds. Initially, I didn't have a DJ, so I had to go back to New York and ask Larry LeBrand and a couple others to come out and play. And they told me no, but in New York, Frankie Knuckles was in the shadows of Larry LeBrand, so he was not going to go anywhere there. And when he saw the place, he was like, yeah, this is cool for a club. This area, this was a coat room right here, this area right here, where that guy's office is, where well, it used to be my office. All of this was open. Okay. Hello, sir. How are you? This used to be a dance club, the whole building. Oh, yeah. yeah, in the 70s. Right here is where you went down to the dance floor. Frankie played right here. From here all the way back here was the DJ booth. During the disco era, it was the worst financial time in America since the Great Depression. We had a very, very horrible recession. Culturally, in America, things were pretty bad. Every record company had their version of this cover. And this is a, this is a nice, like, you know, tasteful one, disco single, okay? Disco single. And the Atlantic one covered half of the thing. Disco single. People would go in the store and unplayed, unlistened to, don't know the record, 100,000 copies would sell just because it said this on it. They started putting this banner on every piece of shit they wanted to sell. And after two years of that, this became really a bad taste in people's mouth. It was billed as teen night at Comiskey Park for the twine-eyed doubleheader between the Chicago White Sox and the Detroit Tigers. The feature attraction was a disco demolition between games. Local radio morning man Steve Dahl was the catalyst. He is anti-disco. Between games, Dahl was to finish by blowing up a box full of disco records, which the fans were to bring with them to the ballpark. But some seven to 10,000 fans poured onto the field, setting bonfires and burning more disco records. By the time Chicago police were able to clear the field, the damage had been done. I was an usher, taking people to their seat at ball games while saving up money for my first synthesizer. Steve Dahl was on the radio saying that disco sucked. He was frustrated because he had been fired from DAI because they changed from a rock format to a disco format. I was on the ground at the front gate, and all of the records that were piling up at the gate weren't necessarily disco records. Most of them were just black records. The message was, well, if you're black or you're gay, then you're not one of us. You're not truly a Chicagoan. We didn't think that it was real. We just thought that people were having fun. But it played out in our lives in a very dramatic way. All of a sudden, there was sort of a them and us. And I think that us was strong because we went further underground. We went deeper. I remember the first time I saw you was at the warehouse. Was it? You had on this taffeta skirt, maybe a pink top. Oh my God. Do you remember that? Heck no. I went to the warehouse when I was 15 years old. There was this place on 63rd, and we used to always go, everybody went over there to get a phony Illinois state ID. Or you could just take somebody's random birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> I was 16 years old, my first time going to the warehouse. I had heard all kinds of rumors and things about, you know, being a gay club. But once you got into the music, none of that even mattered anymore. The warehouse was a members only club. They want people to go there and not bring any of that outside shit in. You know, no homophobia, no sexism towards women. 
Sound system at the warehouse was designed by Richard Long, one of the best sound designers in the world. You can go in the warehouse and you can experience the music. You can literally sit there high or not, because the, the music will make you high. I stumbled into the warehouse by word of mouth. It wasn't like, oh, oh, that's music, and I'm gonna go dance to that. It was like, what is this? I've never experienced anything like this in my life. House music at that time, it was anything that Frankie Knuckles would play at the warehouse, which was the coolest underground dance music. In some groups you wouldn't hear anywhere else except for the warehouse, yeah. which is what you know what you would crave. Like I only heard that song here. You'd have Europe and Philadelphia and New York all playing on the same dance floor. No matter what style of music it was, if it fit into the set. It worked, so you heard all sounds, textures in the course of the night. Some of the records were too short, so Frankie would mess with them and have two copies and make them longer and also like play the breakdown twice or play the best part a couple of times or skip the shitty part. I mean, I almost couldn't quite figure out if there were songs at one time because sometimes it was just like this sort of soundscape. One of the sound effects Frankie would do would be this train that gets louder and louder and louder and until it comes by you, it goes, mm. was like a revelation. He didn't just mix a couple of records. He brought in a whole new style of music. That's something. Frankie would give out these tapes of his mixing. Those cassettes would go around to thousands of people because people would make copies of copies of copies of copies. You hear a Frankie Knuckles remix and you know it's Frankie Knuckles. That style of DJ spread throughout the city because of those tapes. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. We didn't have too many places to party because of the gang problem in Chicago. So we would prefer to sit at home between house parties and we would listen to Frankie tapes. The city had said the warehouse was no longer safe. Like, it might cave in, so you better stop. And Frankie was like, oh, it's a good chance for me to become a club owner. So that's when he opened up the club, the power plant. I didn't have a DJ, so I approached Ron Hardy. I got a new club for you, the Music Box. When I first went to the Music Box, I was about 16. And when I went, I heard music playing like, walking up, the closer I got, the harder it felt. Like, whoo, 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 whoo. I never heard anything like that in my goddamn life. Ron Hardy was just like, yeah, all night, all night, you know. Ron Hardy at the Music Box would play anything at any time, anywhere, any kind of way. He would spin them backwards, he would scratch the needle across the record. I loved listening to Roddy because you never knew what you were gonna get. His actual style came out of him being a heroin addict because he thought the music was a little slow, so he pitched it up. So as I remember the music box, it was in the lower Wacker Drive area, you know, an area that was loading docks. It always looked the same time. It was lit differently. It was almost green, as I remember. It felt like you were in a sci-fi movie. Went in there, pitch black, one cheesy color light bulb. Couldn't see nothing in there. There were no seats, no chairs, just a big dance floor. Music was so loud that you were forced to dance to it. 
When I think back to the early days listening to Ron Hardy play, listening to Frankie play, my thrill was really the way that they were directing the crowd, keeping moving them higher and just higher and just bringing them into, I mean, just crazy frenzies. There was a good period of time where I was just going over different people's houses and learning how to DJ, basically, until I got my own equipment. Then I was in my basement for eight hours a day. I'd be up till four o'clock in the morning and my mom wouldn't even know. I taught myself how to scratch, how to put records in reverse and make them stay on beat and how to phase two records together. When I first started DJing, I had to bring my whole sound system. We used to have sound clashes like against each other in gyms, you know. Back then we had to buy two copies of every record. That's how you did tricks back in the day. You would, you know, cut one and two, and that's how, that was our equivalent of sampling and stuff. If we had a new record that nobody else knew about, we'd take a magic marker and we'd black out the whole label. So that if some other DJ came over and said, hey, what's that you're playing? They have no idea. And we proceeded to get out there and just DJ every high school party you could imagine, every Sweet 16, every anything. A lot of schools in the late 70s, early 80s, would throw dances to raise money for school activities. Mendo was an all-Catholic boys' school. They found quite a business in these high school dances. People would come from all over the city to go to these parties. Back then, I was doing promotions myself, and uh, I bought Frankie Knuckles to Mendo. I made $10,000 in high school. i never forget it, too, because I had a Louis Vuitton briefcase, and I had all the money in the briefcase. These parties kind of bridged that gap and kind of made the connection with the underground gay disco scene and these middle-class black kids on the South Side. That was the perfect storm for what was to become house music. James Record, Your Love was like the anthem for years, mm -hmm. everybody wanted a copy of it. We were making cassettes, so somebody got lucky enough to get a reel to reel and they made cassettes. And I actually pressed one up. I paid like $50 at Universal to make an acetate of it. That's how big that record was. Car blasting, going down Rush Street, all the yeah. places, down. everybody's car doors, windows down, blasting it. I mean, no wonder it was kind of the catalyst for the beginning of this whole thing. Everyone has a different opinion of where House came from and who started it. Back in around 84, it started to mold into a particular sound. It started to be a particular pattern that you start hearing. And then it got labeled house music. Jamie Principal, he was a guy from Chicago who had some music in his ears and he put it down on tape and then somehow Frankie got a hold of it and started playing it. It became a cassette tape that was passed around because Frankie played it at the warehouse and everybody heard it there. Jamie Principal, Your Love was huge in Chicago. It must have been 10,000 copies of that tape. And we would all sit in our houses and listen to them. I thought he was European. You know, I didn't know he was a brother from Chicago. It was one of those things that when you hear it, you knew something special was about to happen. Would you grab this over here, please? Okay, here we go. This is, this is a test pressing of on and on Jesse Sanders. Uh, 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 you know, it turned out to be a classic, and as you see, it's probably it's probably brand new. I had become pretty popular as a DJ. Vince Lawrence started coming around and brought me his record. I think I was 17 years old. I had put together my group of friends, Z Factor, and we had written our first song, Fast Cars. I wanted to keep him around to kind of pick his brain because I had ideas to make a record. At the time, I played this bootleg mashup with Donna Summer, Toot Toot, Hey Beep Beep in it, and 
It had the horn from Funky Town. It had such a mesmerizing groove that I thought it would be perfect to be kind of a signature song for me. But somebody stole my records, and that was one of them. And it pissed me off so much that I decided that I was going to make my own version. So Vince Lawrence and I are in my bedroom, which at the time was our studio. I have my four-track recorder, my Poly 61, and an 808. Roland said that the 808 was designed as a practice device, but for us, you know, this was the beginning. We just really wanted to make a record that would move people the way the best parts of the best songs move people at those parties. I think I had $800 to my name at the time and met Larry Sherman who ran the pressing plant and said hey I want to get you know as many 12 inch records of, of this as I can get so we started pressing we learned the pressing process we'd be at the plant packaging them ourselves pick them up and just take them to the stores and sell them it started snowballing so much that we had to come down here to this basement and we formulated it like a business I remember standing right here when they did the ABC TV news interview and I first told them that I wanted to be the next Motown in Barry Gordy, Just A Records. We went from store to store to store like a paper route. And we might have sold 10 or 12,000 records that first week. And I said, fuck parties, we're in a record business now. I felt that we could take this music and make it into something big. It didn't matter that On and All was a bootleg of a bootleg of a bootleg. It was a record. I don't think House would exist without On and On having been pressed. Before that, I don't think any of us ever dreamed that we could make a record at home. The entire city woke up and started making records. Everybody started doing it. Jesse makes it to me.